Welcome to everybody who is joining us to this panel uh, session, this plenary panel session on climate and nature, how nature-based solutions can mitigate climate change. My name is Charles Goddard. I'm the editorial director of the Economist Group and also executive director of the World Ocean Summit. And for those of this, uh, for those of you that have been with us uh, at the World Ocean Summit, you will know that we've been talking about uh, nature-based solutions uh, to climate change, uh, solutions such as leveraging um, uh, uh, leveraging uh, coastal and marine ecosystems to uh, sequester and store carbon for quite a few years now at the World Ocean Summit. And indeed, uh, in uh, the summit in Mexico in 2018, we um, highlighted one of the very first insurance instruments um, to address the protection uh, uh, and restoration, indeed, of reefs um, uh, and coastal areas from severe storms. My sense is that we have moved on quite a way since that, um, and that it feels like uh, this set of issues around nature-based solutions are becoming uh, mainstream or mainstreaming themselves to some degree. Um, I think this is partly to do with some of the people that are, uh, I'm delighted to be able to welcome shortly uh, on this um, particular panel um, uh, and their efforts, but partly also because I think nature itself has now come onto the international policy agenda in quite a big way. Um, uh, particularly since recent reports have been released by the UN, um, and as we have the Convention on Biological Diversity um, looming um, uh, this year, uh, we've now seen nature uh, taking up a part of the, uh, the global agenda, the global public policy agenda, connecting itself, of course, to climate change, and they are very, very closely connected uh, and in many ways of equal importance. Um, and... Uh, both nature and climate change represent a significant, um, uh, a significant potential impact um, to our societies, indeed, and to life, uh, to life on Earth, unless we deal with them. So the challenge, it seems to me, is to one uh, is really one of how we find uh, ways to scale um, nature-based solutions, and indeed uh, to find projects and investors uh, to build and accelerate uh, the nature-based solutions that we're just about to talk about. So let me introduce to you today our excellent four, distinguished four panelists. Uh, Carlos Duarte, who is Professor of Marine Science uh, at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia and a leading marine biologist. Um, Chip Cunliffe, who is Director of Sustainability, Sustainable Development rather, at AXA XL, uh, an insurance company and of course a leading light uh, uh, bringing to life the Ocean uh, Risk and Resilience uh, Action um, uh, Alliance, uh, O-R-R-A-A. -A. Carol Poir, who is Coral Reef Rescue Initiative Manager at WWF, uh, and among her many other uh, hats, she is the editor, too, of WWF's uh, Living Blue Planet Report. Uh, and Tangi Gahoma, who is Chair of the African Group of Negotiators on climate change and a special advisor to the president of Gabon uh, and in his spare time uh, manages to do um, manages to be a board member too of the Green Climate Fund. So welcome to all of our distinguished speakers. Let me start uh, with Carlos, if I may, uh, Carlos Duarte, and just uh, really let's focus around what we're going to be talking about today and try and sort of uh, set the scene a little bit. You've done a great deal of work, Carlos, on blue carbon Blue carbon, uh, which is in a way, sort of many ways, a catch all term for um, many of the ocean nature based solutions to climate change. Um, I wonder if you'd start off by briefly telling us about the status of blue carbon and indeed uh, any emerging new ideas um, and solutions in this field. Thank you, Charles. So, as you cor uh, correctly pointed out, uh, nature based solutions are gaining a lot of momentum as a main pathway to address our climate challenge. The reason for that is that 38% of the cumulative emissions of greenhouse gases actually derive from destruction of ecosystems and nature. There is a misnomer called land use change, but in fact, it's not coming only from land use change, it's actually coming from destroying uh, ecosystems at sea. So it's a blue component to that 38%. And therefore, uh, there is a, a, an option to help mitigate climate change by avoiding future loss of ecosystems and, and marine life, but also by rebuilding the marine life that uh, we lost. So uh, I, 
I like to uh, define nature-based solutions as a pathway to decarbonize the atmosphere by recarbonizing the biosphere. And the aim is not only to avoid losses, the aim is to uh, get back the 50% or so of the blue natural capital of marine life that we lost. So blue uh, carbon is about uh, not only conserving the, uh, the biomass resources that we have at sea, but also rebuilding that biomass. And last year, we published a strategy to be able to rebuild the abundance of marine life by 2050. So it is doable. And indeed, a lot of work has gone into developing strategies to uh, mitigate climate change with nature-based solutions focused on conservation and restoration of mangroves, uh, seagrasses, and salt marshes. Those are the mature components of blue carbon, but there are a lot of emerging ones. For instance, consider that before we use coal and gas, we actually literally burn whales to light the streets of North America and uh, also Europe. So much of the, uh, of the biomass that was in whales is now uh, carbon dioxide creating problems for us in the atmosphere. Wouldn't it be wonderful that that carbon is back in the form of whales creating wealth and benefits to our ocean? And we have calculated now that if we rebuild the abundance of large whales, which were depleted to one-fifth of the former abundance, we can actually sequester one gigaton of carbon dioxide uh, per year just through that. So the components of, of blue carbon are not only about fringing ecosystems on the coastline, they're also about rebuilding the abundance of large marine animals. They're also about protecting the sediments in the seafloor from trolling and other disturbances that release the carbon that has accumulated over millennia in the seafloor. And it's also about the scaling solutions like seaweed aquaculture which is a scalable solution that generates benefits on the environment and contributes to sequestered carbon. So it's a lot of uh, attention now to see with farming as also a pathway to uh, develop uh, uh, nature-based solutions and the capacity of the ocean to contribute to climate action and climate mitigation. And together, uh, this larger and growing family of blue carbon options uh, provide a very significant capacity to a mitigate climate change and put us in the pathway to address our climate goals, but also generate multiple benefits uh, for communities and, uh, and nations that are, have uh, ocean environments that will benefit from a healthier uh, status. So uh, there's a lot of uh, action now in broadening this family. And then uh, I believe that we have now about 70 nations that include a uh, blue carbon op uh, actions within the nationally determined contributions. And I would like to see that growing, moving to Glasgow. Carlos, thank you very much for setting the scene there. And I, I will come back to the NDCs a little bit later because I want to really uh, try and understand how, how that process may be accelerated. Just one very quick uh, follow-up question. The high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy in its report on ocean solutions to climate change said that uh, or estimated that around between 0.9 uh, and 1.4% uh, of needed uh, annual emission reductions um, between 2030 and 2050 might come from these kinds of nature-based solutions. And it was focused particularly on um, uh, the, 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 the mature components that you mentioned earlier, particularly um, mangroves, seagrasses. Uh, but do you think that there is scope for a greater, a greater level of mitigation if one was to include some of the new components that you mentioned? Yes, and I'm an expert within the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, so I serve as a member of the expert group. And as you correctly pointed out, this estimate refers to the mature components of blue carbon, but the scalability of seaweed aquaculture plus the options that go beyond the coastline into addressing issues on carbon stocks in sediments uh, across the continental shelves, but also rebuilding the abundance of uh, large marine animals, probably will uh, increase the scope uh, tenfold relative to the contribution of those mature options within the blue carbon family. So I'm hopeful that we can see 10% of the solution coming from uh, nature-based solutions across the whole ocean. That's really fascinating to hear. Um, Chip, can I turn to you and very simple straightforward question why is an insurance company 
um, uh, getting excited about nature-based solutions to climate change. Thanks, Charlie. Um, look, AXA has been very much focused on uh, climate change and our commitment to um, climate and, and biodiversity loss for a number of years now. We have, uh, in terms of our investments, uh, focused uh, that on ensuring that they align with the Paris Agreement of 1.5 degrees warming. Um, we have put 350 million uh, euros into a, a climate and biodiversity fund. Um, and of course, we, you know, we are working uh, through the Ocean Risk Initiative that I run uh, to develop solutions to some of these major problems. Um, I, I think that um, investing in nature could become a, a significant risk of, uh, well, not investing in nature, but could become a significant risk. And of course, I think that um, nature-based solutions are an integral part or should be an integral part of disaster risk management, especially in those countries that are likely to be uh, more vulnerable um, to uh, the impacts of climate change. So, you know, we have a, a I suppose, a, a twofold focus. One is the investment side um, of, of what can be, what the opportunities might be um, in developing a market, but also a risk perspective um, and trying to understand better, really, um, the importance of nature based solutions um, as, a, as a way of not only mitigating um, climate change, but of course, we also need to look at adaptation as well. So just on that question, I mean, we do tend to focus a lot on mitigation, but uh, an adaptation is a poor second partner in all of this. How, how do you see this risk perspective helping to play out on adaptation? I think it's really, really an important question. We haven't, we seem to, we do need to focus on that, it seems to me. I, I think you're right. I mean, I think that, you know, we're likely to see, um, you know, there was likely to see a trillion dollars worth of impact on coastal urban areas um, as we progress uh, this century. Um, and that's really related to the impacts of, of, of sea level rise um, and coastal flooding. Now, if we don't um, integrate adaptation measures into, uh, into, our, into our plans, then I think we are, we're missing a trick. Um, ultimately, things like mangroves, um, as Carlos um, uh, intimated, they provide $65 billion worth of protection um, along coasts every year. But you take those away and you'll see 15 million more people uh, flooded by, um, by coastal flooding. So, you know, I think that the, the, the role of mangroves and reefs um, in adaptation is hugely critical. Um, and in fact, one of the things that we're currently um, undertaking at the moment is the coastal risk index. Uh, and that for the first time will integrate um, mangroves and coral reefs into our risk models. Um, and so we're looking at both flood hazard in one sense or what, one part of it, but we're also then looking at and the impact of social vulnerability um, of the degradation of those ecosystems. And then, of course, we're looking, we're going to start to look at the fiscal, the impact on the blue economy if you take away reefs and mangroves. So we're starting with reefs and mangroves, that's where the data is. And I think this is a, 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 a major that with data, with, it's very difficult for us to, to develop the policies and develop the uh, insurance mechanisms and indeed the financial mechanisms. Um, to, to, to move this uh, and indeed to utilize nature-based solutions. Chip, thank you. And that leads us very nicely, I think, into uh, a discussion around reefs. And Carol, Carol Poir, you, you know, you, we all know that coral reefs are in a very worrying state. And uh, uh, if current trends continue by 2050, as I, I think you've mentioned in your reports, up to 90% of reefs could uh, disappear by 2050. How, how do coral reefs fit into uh, the blue carbon picture, in your view? I mean, we're talking about coral reefs and associated ecosystems, and mangroves are a critical part of that narrative and, and, and that whole system as well. So what we're trying to do a reef rescue initiative with our partners is really looking at where are the survivor reefs going to be, these reefs, these reefs where are less, uh, less exposed to climate change and prioritize investments around reducing the anthropogenic threats on these potentially survivor reefs that will repopulate 
the research in the region. So building off the work of the University of Queensland. So our approach to nature-based solutions is really a very climate smart and prioritized approach. We're looking at where is the need greatest as well. Uh, 80% of these reefs are in developing work in developing countries where people are incredibly dependent on these reefs for food security and safety as well. So by, by focusing on, on uh, restoring these mangroves, uh, investing in better water quality for these reefs uh, to reduce uh, sewage and sedimentation from unsustainable agriculture onto these reefs, we find that the reefs can actually function and contribute as a part of a bigger nature-based solution approach. Looking at the bigger picture, we would say as WWF and our partners, uh, it's not a, a, a uh, where you just look at the blue carbon element, you're looking at the whole system and you're looking at the dependencies of the communities on the system. And by promoting restoration and resilience building, you're finding that nature can provide and support a whole lot more than, uh, than just the climate narrative. So I think, and just, just to sort of be, be clear, you're, you're obviously focused broadly at, in a holistic way at nature-based solutions, but from a coral reef perspective, coral reefs are, uh, in a sense, protective mechanisms for other nature-based solutions that uh, do sequester carbon, if we're talking about blue carbon specifically. So coral reefs are kind of protected barrier. They need to be uh, functioning and resilient in order to be able to protect some of the other blue carbon systems that are there. Absolutely. And really looking at how do we then keep the reefs that are going to be surviving. We've already lost 50% of our coral reefs globally. And that's not due to climate change. That's just from unsustainable uh, coastal development and overfishing. So what's left is already under a lot of pressure from climate change. So protecting those reefs, reducing the pressure on those reefs will help the mangrove systems and, and, and the associated systems, the coastal ecology function and thrive better. So it is it is a part a much bigger picture. I mean, a lot of the mangrove forests that we're talking about are critical nursery grounds for reef fish, right? So in, by by mangroves uh, uh, being restored and functioning health and, and health, uh, we find that there is a, a value to 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 the coral reefs and you know a healthy and thriving coral reef sequesters carbon as well through fish and, and fish populations that also sequester carbon. And Carlos was talking about whales and other cetaceans, and of fish also sequester carbon. So I think a healthy and functioning ecosystem and ocean ecosystem will, will sequester carbon in, in a much, much more efficient way long term. So really, we are talk we're talking about the integrated systems that are uh, the approach should be an integrated approach to all of the systems. Carlos has got his hand up, and I'll just allow you to have a quick interjection, Carlos, before I come to Tangi. Off, off you go. Yes, I would like to emphasize uh, Carlos's point on the importance of coral reefs for both uh, adaptation and mitigation, but also the projection that we might lose 90% of coral reefs by 2035. It's under best uh, current science, but in fact, I don't think that anybody is willing to uh, see coral reefs uh, go under their, their watch. So last year, the G20 focused strongly on how we can secure a future for coral reefs. And the G20 agreed to create a global coral reef R&D accelerator platform that is going is now being funded and will be actually operated from Saudi Arabia, but it'll be a global program to accelerate our capacity to conserve and restore coral reefs so that that projection is not realized. So let me turn to Tangi. And thank you. You represent the African group uh, of climate change negotiators. To what extent are ocean-based solutions to climate change on the African climate agenda? And among those, ocean-based, nature-based uh, solutions to climate change? For Africa, it's a very uh, sensitive subject because... Uh, uh, we had the chance at the last COP in Madrid to talk for the first time about uh, ocean, you know. And uh, because ocean is the same than uh, forest, there is there are natural carbon sink. And a lot of people think that we don't, uh, they, they didn't require uh, human action. And then we don't have to talk about it under uh, the negotiation. But for Africa, ocean is more about adaptation than mitigation. And we create a specific uh, initiative under the African group of negotiators, uh, which is called uh, AI, the African Adaptation Initiative. Because if you see Africa, we have 
Dakar, Abidjan, Lagos, Cape Town, Maputo, Dar es Salaam, Libreville. We have a lot of um, country with the megalopole on, uh, on the coast. And we are extremely vulnerable to the sea, the, the sea rising. So for us, it's more about adaptation. And uh, it's clear that we need to, 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 to negotiate on ocean because we need to take action, but we must organize capacity building workshop on ocean for that and seas to consider the IPCC special report um, on, uh, on ocean. And we must clearly understand the link between uh, the role of ocean, the link between our human action and the carbon, uh, the blue carbon. Um, if I can take the example of Gabon, Gabon, the, our um, maritime area has the same size of the, the, our territory. So it is almost equally important to manage well our maritime area. But there is no, under the UNFCCC, there is no clear process to have a program of sustainable management. So it's depend on each country to have uh, its uh, maritime uh, uh, management program and in Gabon we we establish a program a blue carbon program we call it in French Gabon Blue and uh, today is a necessary component of uh, our development plan and uh, this is actually the only way for African countries to to protect the for, to protect the ocean we need to have we need to take uh, action individually. So you mentioned that uh, it's the discussion in Africa is more about adaptation than mitigation, but obviously in, in Gabon, you've got some degree of uh, mitigation activities going on through your blue carbon program. What do you think, does this, this, does, does this discussion that we're having today give you some sort of sense, some sense of the opportunity potentially for uh, sort of higher levels of investment in, in blue carbon? And is that something you, you think you might want to build into the discussions around COP26, for example? Yes, it's clear that we, we need to have some goals. Uh, for example, we need to have, we, because we are part of all uh, uh, the conservation initiative, we are strongly convinced that we need to have a goal that 30% um, of the maritime territory of each country need to be protected. And in Gabon, for example, we are 26% of the maritime area under uh, marine uh, protected area. So it's clear that uh, we need to take action because uh, ocean is um, around extreme pressure, but it is also an economy of blue. We have also a strong uh, blue economy in terms of fishing, in terms of oil production and so. So uh, there, there are uh, a lot of initiatives that we can do in, in that way. Thank you. Let's turn, if we can now, because uh, we are running through this um, discussion very quickly. Let's turn, if we can, to um, this question of investment and financing uh, around and valuation uh, of uh, nature-based solutions. And perhaps, first of all, just let's ask this question, because it's the question that precedes the investment question in a way. What, how do we assess the economic and societal value of nature-based solutions? Um, uh, and what emerging sort of methodologies and trends are there in this process? Because unless we can get that right, we're not really going to convince, I think, investors and others and governments, indeed, both and the private sector to think about how they would invest in this. Um, I wonder, perhaps I can, Carol, perhaps I wonder if I could start with you. Uh, do you have any, any thoughts around that and how, how we would begin to value um, economic and societal benefits? Sure. Thanks, Charlie. I think, you know, current estimates are that um, the, the coastal protection that coral reefs provides uh, and in terms of livelihood and coastal protection, it's valued at 36 billion U.S. dollars and, and coastal fisheries is valued, valued at 6 billion U.S. dollars. These are, I mean, these are already quite, uh, I would say, conservative estimates as to, you know, what are the, what is what are coral reefs contributing 
The other bigger challenge that we that we we are failing to address is that when coral reef ecosystems do start to collapse, you know, due to climate change and, and, and rising sea temperatures, we will find that there will be a huge nutrition challenge. And that would lead to developmental stunting in a lot of coastal communities and developing countries. And the impact, the economic impact of that is far reaching beyond just the livelihood challenge. You're talking about major developmental challenges as well. So I think there we need to look at and when we start valuing the the uh, it, uh, the ecosystem services of coral reefs and 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 some other e- and, and associated ecosystems we need to take a much broader and inclusive picture we know that climate change impacts women and children uh, a lot more intensely than the general population and we need to look at the loss of uh, the loss of uh, a participation of women and children in in the economies if when we don't protect nature well as well um, so a much broader approach would look at not only the direct impact in terms of loss of job and, and coastal protection, but also nutrition and uh, food security impacts uh, leading on from that, and also loss of uh, opportunities for women and children and who will develop into adults to engage in the economies. So that much broader approach, I think, requires a rethink on how we value nature. Um, I think recently, you know, with, with COVID and zoonotic diseases, we've seen there's a huge link between the loss of nature and the rise of zoonotic diseases. And so, again, if we start looking at a much broader approach as to what does nature truly contribute, I think we will then truly understand the return on investment is much greater than what we uh, initially perceive it to be. Carlos, would, do you think we have, we have to take that far more holistic approach to the valuation question? Yeah, so in fact, uh, I witness now a situation where the financial resources that are being made available uh, to invest in blue carbon resources are growing rapidly, particularly with the pledges for uh, carbon neutrality of many corporations that are seeking then to invest in uh, in carbon credits in blue carbon resources. And yet uh, we don't see the supply of available projects matching that, uh, that those financial resources. So I believe we need a clearinghouse that matches if, uh, demand with supply and also that there is a, a verification system where the projects that are being made available on the ground are verified and the value in terms of, of blue carbon benefits of those projects are assessed uh, rigorously. So I believe that Clearinghouse will be a very important mechanism to match uh, demand with supply of projects because I, I see now the supply not really being uh, mapped properly at the scale of the investment. But I also uh, uh, concur that it's very important to also value the social benefits of investments in blue carbon, because unlike many other climate solutions, blue carbon are strongly place-based, and they generate uh, benefits or may generate these benefits if improperly uh, properly delivered to, to local communities. So I would like to commend, for, for instance, Gabon and many other nations in uh, showing leadership in blue carbon in Africa, like Kenya for their approach towards uh, making these projects available and uh, opening the projects for investors that are strongly place-based, so the communities play a a strong role in deciding how this project should proceed, how, uh, where the projects need to be conducted, so that they are custodians and they have a sense of ownership in the project as well. And in addition to uh, mangrove restoration and other projects, which now contain most of the portfolio, of blue carbon uh, investment. Then in, uh, in uh, East Africa, there's a strong development of seaweed aquaculture. And we're seeing that seaweed aquaculture, which also contributes to climate uh, mitigation, being uh, an essential element of empowering women in communities, because the farmers of the sea tend to be women in Zanzibar and Madagascar. And we're seeing very strong benefits in terms of community uh, benefits and resilience and particularly women empowerment in the communities through these uh, seaweed farming uh, projects and also blue carbon uh, programs. So I'm very hopeful, uh, but we do need to create this global greenhouse matching uh, projects available in the ground with uh, opportunities for investment and also value as Chip indicated and also Carol, the very important significance of blue carbon projects, not only for mitigation, but also for adaptation in terms of avoiding damages from the sea level rise. So let me let me just pick up and uh, I'm going to skip over that question, Kit Chip, if I can, and just come to another question that was raised by Carlos. And that is that, you know, clearly there's 
there aren't enough projects out there to invest in, um, projects that private sector companies such as yourself would be interested in. in. Uh, so where, what are the barriers to finding um, new projects, to developing new projects and to making them investable, do you think? Well, I think there are there are probably four barriers. I think there's, a, of course, what what Carlos was just saying there about the lack of pipeline. Uh, we understand that, and indeed, that is a, a, a major uh, element. I think there's there's the, the the piece about, as I said before, about the insufficient data for for investors potentially uh, to start investing in in that space. Um, and that's not just for for those investors, but also for the for the risk managers and for ourselves to be able to pr- price that risk uh, better. I think it's about the enabling policies, um, which becomes a barrier. So, you know, in some parts of the world, we can't use blue carbon um, necessarily um, or, or at least uh, drive that uh, market. And I think that the, 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 the biggest one possibly uh, relates to a return on investment. So, you know, if you're looking at a, um, a, 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 a major corporation or, or, you know, somebody wanting to to invest in um, blue carbon, then are they getting the, the market rate return? Now, of course, this is where um, I think we, we need to use blended finance. Um, so it's not just uh, the private finance that works uh, on its own, but does so alongside um, other uh, finance that's available. Um, and this is really where the Ocean Risk and Resilience Action Alliance, so Aura, um, is trying to, to move um, and try to enable um, the the development and identification of that pipeline of projects, and so um, we have various things that are, are working at the moment. So we have a blue carbon and resilience credit. We're starting to work on a, a potentially a coastal resilience bond. Um, of course, there's the coastal risk, in, risk index that I talked about a second ago, or just before. But all of these different opportunities um, are becoming available, and you know, Aura is very much there to uh, to, to drive a target of $500 million worth of investment into um, nature-based solutions uh, by 2030. Um, and I think it's it's really critical that we get alone. It can't just be the investment community and it can't just be the private sector that, that, that does that. We have to work alongside governments um, and the NGO community. And of course, it all has to be based in science. We have to understand the, the scientific um, uh, uh, the scientific basis um, for uh, for the value that these ecosystems provide us, um, and I think that's really critical. And so, some interesting work being undertaken uh, related to mangrove potential mangrove insurance, and indeed the, the use of insurance to restore mangroves. Um, uh, and a, a, a report uh, that came out in the for the Caribbean um, last year, um, indicating that you know the cost of restoration of mangroves. Um, is about twenty three thousand dollars on average um, around the Caribbean, forty five thousand in in in, um, in Florida. But you look at the 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 cost of a seawall, and you're looking at twenty million dollars um, for the same uh, area uh, that's protected. So I think there's a real need to to focus on nature based solutions in the long term. Thank you. Before I come to you. Um... Tangi, with a, a follow-up question there. Carol, you had your hand raised. Your your thoughts? Now. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to just uh, agree with Chip there. I think blended finance is a very important part of that, of that picture. Um, we've just received a grant from the Global Environment Facility to develop a pipeline of projects for Fiji, Solomon Islands, Indonesia, uh, Philippines, Tanzania, Madagascar, and Cuba, where we find these less uh, climate-exposed reefs. So there is a lot of work to be done in creating... Uh, pipelines of projects and investable projects, providing the technical assistance to these countries and communities and local governments. And, and that's the type of investment that is often very difficult to find funding for because nobody wants to invest in the pipeline. They want to have investment ready projects, uh, but they don't realize they just don't happen overnight. You need to invest in the technical assistance and the development of the pipeline in order to have good investable projects. So I think definitely there is a gap there that we're finding and, and we're really looking to, forward to working with partners, you know, with, with like AXA and, and others to, to, to solve this problem where we are creating a good and, and stable pipeline of great investable projects that will benefit governments and coastal communities. 
Thank you. Tanki, Tanki, I'm just going to come to Tanki if I can, because we, we've got five minutes left, and I'm conscious that I want to sort of just at least address the very final thought that I want to, and that is around COP26, if I can. And uh, Tanki, I'm sure you agreed with a number of the uh, the obstacles that were raised there, but can I can we just turn our thoughts finally to COP26 um, and to this question of what um, you feel ocean solutions to climate change might be uh, is as part of your negotiating strategy uh, in this process leading up to COP26. To what extent do you feel that ocean solutions to climate change are important and uh, should be part of NDCs as we move into uh, getting that agreement done? Uh, um, we are thinking that uh, the coastal habitat and the coral reef provide important services that include coastal protection from storm and sea level rise and improve also uh, the quality of water, for example, and reduce soil erosion. Uh, they can be highly cost effective to protect all, um, all the coast. But for us, one solution, and maybe it's the, the better solution, is to have marine protected area across all the continents. So we will create an ecosystem approach and we can help to restore and protect all these critical habitat. So uh, we need to work like a network. We have a lot of megalopole on the coast and we need to create this, uh, this network to protect uh, the continent. Because you know uh, that 70% uh, of uh, fish live at maybe uh, 50 or 100 kilometers from the coast. So all this ecosystem can be protected if we have some marine protected areas. And we think this can be a very good option for us. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Carlos, can I come to you just on that final question? What are your hopes uh, for ocean-based solutions to climate change and particularly nature-based solutions to climate change within that in, uh, in the coming COP26? So my hope is that we uh, stop uh, siloing different problems and look at interactions and synergies between problems. I think we need to look at mitigation and adaptation as, as uh, synergies and look at co-benefits between actions that we adopt in terms of the adaptation and, uh, and mitigation co-benefits, but also recognize the important uh, nexus between biodiversity and climate. And I think we need to bring that a uh, better understanding of how we can achieve uh, triple wins on uh, mitigation adaptation and improving livelihoods to rebuilding biodiversity into COP26. Thank you. That was very short and sweet. I thought it was very excellent, John. Uh, Chip, briefly, we've got uh, we've got about a, a minute and a half. If you've got 30 seconds or 40 seconds, what, what are your thoughts? Um, well, look, I, I think that um, we know that nature-based solutions are, are rising up the political agenda um, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, across... Uh, G7, G20, and of course across the world. I mean, I think it's, it's really important that everybody um, recognises the the, uh, the the what nature-based solutions can do, and I think we are already seeing that. So I think that um, I think that the fact that we are able to drive that ahead along, you know, even this forum it is you know hugely important in in uh, showcasing that, and I think the fact that the Americans have, have sort of started to to move. Um, towards um, you know, the, the, uh, you know, very much a, a climate focus over for this next presidency, and, and hopefully, um, uh, you know, that, that will uh, resonate across the world. Thank you, Carol. You will have the last word. Your your final thoughts on, particularly on COP twenty six. I was going to say, I do agree with Carlos. We need to look at the whole picture, and that's not just addressing climate, but the loss of nature and reversing that. And that's a, that's a bigger part of sustainable development. We can't have sustainable development without addressing the loss of nature and addressing climate change. I think we need to realize that the most vulnerable people in, on this planet are actually face, bearing the grunt of, of, of the work of protecting nature. We need to be investing more uh, in, in supporting and empowering coastal communities to do the work, to, to support uh, biodiversity recovery and resilience building. And that requires strong ambition, and clear and impactful investment from the global community. And I hope that we can do that not only in Glasgow, but in China for the new uh, Global Goal for Nature. 
yeah, we have to do it in those and all of the rest that come after that. I think this has been a fascinating discussion. What I've taken away certainly is the the really important integrated nature of the problem. Um, it's not just climate change. It's not just nature. Uh, it is those and the solutions bound together uh, that need to be addressed. Um, and indeed, the need to get and quickly um, a set of investable investable opportunities out there, both for governments, for inter multilateral institutions and for the private sector to actually start investing in some of these nature-based solutions. With that, could I thank uh, Carlos Duarte, uh, Chip Cunliffe, uh, Carol Poir, and then Tangi uh, Kahoma for all of your thoughts and um, many thanks indeed. Bye-bye. Thanks, Charlie.